And our next speaker is Zuko. And I don't think I need to introduce him because there is a huge crowd of people who probably came to this hall just to listen to this talk. Maybe even came to the Congress just to listen to this talk. <laughs> so the founder of Zcash, Zuko. A round of applause, a huge, huge round of applause. Thank you. Oh my God, there's so many people. I think I've never stood in front of this many people before in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for being here. I'm Zuko, and I'm the founder of Zcash, and um, a long time ago I worked on Digicash, which was the first cryptocurrency in 1996 for David Chom, uh, who was one of the first cryptographers who made cryptography into an open public science instead of a military secret. Uh, but then three years ago, I got an opportunity to create Zcash with a bunch of other scientists. Um, and Zcash is a combination of Bitcoin technology with encryption. Uh, but this talk is not mostly about that. It's not about Zcash. It's about uh, what I've been doing and learning in the last three years as I travel the world um, talking to people who are using Zcash and building all these related technologies, all these other coins and Ethereum and smart contracts and all that other stuff. So, uh, so this talk is a brief survey of 50 different weird things that I've learned in the last couple of years. And it's very, um, it's very much just, this is just my opinions and uh, biases, and there's a whole bunch of important stuff that's not included in this talk because that's my blind spots. Um, so don't take it as objective truth. And my main questions that I hope to tell you my opinion about is, is all of this cryptocurrency technology and blockchain and Ethereum and all that, is it just, a, is it just hype? Or is it a real thing? Is it, a, is it really revolutionary or what? And is it revolutionary for good or for evil? Okay, real quick. Bitcoin was a revelation when, it, when Satoshi Nakamoto came up with it in 2008. Bitcoin, as you probably mostly know, is this amazing technique to maintain a global consistent ledger that everyone on the planet can simultaneously agree, roughly, to within the last few hours of the contents of this ledger. And it uses this concept of proof of work, which enables mining, which is one of the things that helps prevent this ledger from being fragmented so different people believe different things or getting rolled back or reverted. And then the whole point of it, of using all that breakthrough technology is just to be digital cash, electronic digital cash, um, without relying on any central party. That's the whole point of it. So you have this ledger, and then all you do is keep track of who owns how many bitcoins in the ledger. And that's an awesome breakthrough. It was a computer science and cryptography breakthrough when it came out. Um, and it meant a lot to me personally because I had struggled for at least a decade to invent such a thing and failed. And so I had concluded that it was probably impossible. And so when Satoshi did it, it was quite the revelation and it has led to everything else in this talk. Um, there's a, a typical pattern, I think, that um, new inventions take about five years to get traction and really become mature enough for people to rely on them and, and get more than a fringe degree of usage. And then they typically take another five years after that, so about 10 years total, before they, before they reach their potential and start helping, start providing value in larger and larger amounts to large, larger and larger numbers of people. So Bitcoin has passed the first five years mark. It has reached maturity and has proven that people actually use it for things. And then 
in 2013, uh, Vitalik Buterin came up with the concept of Ethereum. And Ethereum is, the notion is, it's a world computer. So like Bitcoin is a, a worldwide ledger, Ethereum is a worldwide computer, and there's just one computer, and everyone has to line up and take turns submitting their program. So it's in fact a time-sharing machine, if anybody knows what those were. Um, it's the world time-sharing service. And um, the way it works briefly, Ethereum, is that it's all of the miners or validators that in, in Bitcoin, all of those nodes are just making sure the ledger is kept up to date and is internally consistent. And in Ethereum, what all those nodes are doing is running the programs that the users have submitted, and then they're all agreeing on the result of the program. And that's how everyone can rely on the programs to get run correctly. But that's very inefficient. And in fact, both Bitcoin and Ethereum have the exact same scaling limitation or flaw, which is that there's sort of one bucket of service, one, uh, one, um, one uh, yeah, there's, there's, in Bitcoin's case, there's one uh, total amount of transactions, which is about three transactions per second, uh, averaged over like a day. Um, and in Ethereum's case, there's one sort of number of programs that we can run on, on the Ethereum universal shared time sharing system. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't scale up. So if you get uh, twice as many people who want to make transactions or who want to run programs, uh, then either half of them just don't get to do it, or in the case of Bitcoin, the, the price goes up, the price doubles or whatever, until whoever can't afford it doesn't get to do it, and the other half who pay more do get to do it. That's a fundamental problem. Then there's blockchain, which I'm not going to talk much more about in this talk. It's the it's the, a few years ago, a bunch of like bankers and uh, industrial enterprise companies said, ooh, this Bitcoin stuff is weird and revolutionary and scary and creepy. We're not going to touch it with a 10-foot pole, but let's take this component out of it, which we call blockchain, and use that for our businesses. And um, I actually think that's a good idea for some things, but it'll probably be five years since 2014, so it'll probably be a couple more years before we find out if it's really a good idea. Um, and in the meantime, I'm really amused that in 2017, a lot of those same banks and enterprises have decided that Bitcoin is cool after all, and Ethereum is cool after all, and they're actually going to use that. Um, so forget about blockchain, because there's way too much else to talk about in this talk. Hey, cryptography is super awesome. That's one of my favorite things. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, David Chaum, the man that I mentioned, and Whit Diffie and, you know, Hervest and Shamir and all these other people um, were, they acted as activists. They courageously wrested control of the, the nascent science of cryptography and made it part of our communal public knowledge and our uh, our heritage instead of being military secrets. And m almost all of the cryptography that underlies the whole internet and every computer and every database and every cell phone and everything today um, grew out of this, this flourishing starting in the 70s. And a neat fact is that Bitcoin and Ethereum are built with only two of the concepts, two of the building blocks from cryptography, digital signatures and secure hash functions. So for one thing, it's really awesome that you can invent a whole new thing using just digital signatures and secure hash functions. Um, and for another thing, it's a really good question as to what else you could invent if you start using some of the other uh, primitives from cryptography like uh, encryption and zero knowledge proofs, which is part of the Zcash project to do that, to, to use encryption and zero knowledge proofs in, uh, in a cryptocurrency. Okay, then there's this completely other different kind of technology that came out in 2015 called Lightning Network. And by the way, I'm talking fast because I want to have lots of questions. Um, <laughs> Lightning Network is a new idea that was just in, discovered in 2015 as an attempt to overcome this scaling limitation in Bitcoin. And the idea of it is... Uh, if you have a ledger which can't scale, so as you have more and more people who want to make transactions, they exceed the capacity of that ledger to hold new transactions, then 
will use that ledger to record um, deposits, which can then be leveraged by this other off-chain protocol called the Lightning Network. And that one can scale and can do zillions of transactions at very small amounts, microtransactions. Um, and the reason that one works in a decentralized way without relying on any third party is that if there's a conflict, um, a disagreement over who got the micropayments, that can be resolved by um, reference to the central non-scalable shared ledger. Okay, so when we started coming up with this stuff, Wait, don't, don't start reading. If I put up a bunch of words, you'll start reading and stop listening to me. When, we're, when people were coming up with these kind of ideas, like Satoshi's original paper said, this is a way to make decentralized digital cash. So he had a clear idea about what the purpose was. Um, and people who invented these other technologies may have had imaginations about what people would use it for. Um, but what, do ha what have people actually used it for so far? I think it's really useful to learn from real world experience and, and what people are using it for as of today may be surprising. The most important by monetary, if you measure importance by money, the most important use of all of these is um, gambling. <laughs> uh, or, or maybe it's investment for the long term or maybe it's uh, funding. Um, funding new startups by using this kind, these coins as a funding mechanism. So the top line here is people who buy and sell coins, including Bitcoin and Ethereum and Zcash uh, on exchanges. And it's pretty mind boggling since this just really blew up during 2017. But right now, as of the end of 2017, there's half a trillion dollars worth of money, which is a pretty unreliable sort of potentially illusory measure. It's, it's like take, take all the coins of all kinds, all the Bitcoins and all the Ether and all the Zcash and whatever, and then multiply by how much someone paid today for one of those coins and add all those numbers up and it comes up to $500 billion. But it, I don't know how meaningful that number is, but it's absolutely clear that there are a large number of people around the world who are spending or risking or investing a whole lot of money in just hoping that the price will go up. Um, and I think, in my opinion, that's both good and bad, or it could be both good and bad, but you'll have to form your own opinion. But it's definitely big. And then the other big thing that happened in 2017 was people discovered they could use these coins as a way to fund their new project or their new startup. Um, so they... <laughs> they invent a business or a technology or both and then they invent a new coin to go with it and then they sell those coins, the newly generated coins that they just invented to buyers and five billion dollars worth of such coins have been sold in 2017 um, in innumerable new projects, like hundreds I guess of new projects um, some of the biggest ones have raised hundreds of millions of dollars each like for one particular project um, well, that's really interesting, and that could be both good and bad in different ways. I definitely think it's good and bad. It's both good and bad in different ways, in my opinion. Um, the thing that I like best about it is that there's a combination of a scientific breakthrough because Bitcoin turned out to work. Like, remember I said this was a great breakthrough. It wasn't just for me, but for all of computer scientists, like Bitcoin basically did a thing that computer scientists had been confidently telling one another in rigorous proofs was impossible. Uh, and so that broke open this whole field of uh, things that were previously believed to be impossible. And now with Bitcoin and Ethereum, we know that a lot of those things are actually possible. So there's this sudden frontier of new technologies that were previously thought to be impossible that are are now suspected to be possible and it's combined with five billion dollars worth of money now in the hands of either inventors or scammers or whatever but at least at least some of that five billion is going to be funding people to 
try to implement and deploy these new possibilities. Of course, by my, by my rule of thumb, it might take five years before we find out for sure whether any of them actually, oh, you know, which of the new possibilities really work. I'm sure some of them will, but we probably won't know for a while. And I also wonder what will happen to the, like, the market and the money in the interim of five years, because that's a long time for those buyers who bought those coins. Um, Bitcoin was actually used at the beginning of 2017 for retail purchases, but not for very much. There was about a billion dollars in 2017 of people buying stuff with Bitcoin on the internet, mainly buying games from Steam, I think. But, um, but okay, that was already not big, but it was something and it was growing, so that was good, in my opinion. Uh, but now it's dead because of the aforementioned scaling problem. Now the... Um, cost of sending a Bitcoin transaction has skyrocketed from something on the order of 10 cents or a dollar maybe at the beginning of 2017. Um, and now it's skyrocketed to at least $10. Um, on a bad day, it might cost, I don't know, maybe $40 or something to make a Bitcoin transaction. And it doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you're transferring. So if you're transferring a million dollars worth of Bitcoin or a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, it's still going to cost you 10 or 20 or $40 for that transaction. Uh, well, that totally kills the use case of uh, buying Steam games over Bitcoin. So, uh, so that billion dollars a year may fall to like zero next year, for all I know, un unless someone very rapidly solves the scaling problem. Um, <clears throat> okay, the next thing is Crypto Kitties. Behold, this is this was surprising and hilarious to me. It turns out that if you give people a world computer that can compute any computation. Um, they screw around with it for like two years trying to figure out how it works. They sell five billion dollars worth of investments in their new startups. And then they invent a game with collectible cute kittens, kitties uh, that you can collect and own and buy and sell. And each, each kitty is unique. And then you can breed two kitties together to make kittens. And the world computer is crunching away, <laughs> like <laughs> um, making sure that your kittens are the real correct offspring of the parent kitten so that nobody can counterfeit kittens. Um, and so far, and this launched one month ago, like three weeks or something ago. And so far, apparently about $20 million worth of cute kittens have been traded around. Um, and I think this is a harbinger of things to come. I think next year we will see more and more games on these networks. Um, except the scaling problem is also going to hit Ethereum next year like it hit Bitcoin this year. Uh, momentarily already, the Ethereum pipes were clogged with crypto kitties. And so people couldn't get their important ICO funding through and they were complaining. And that's going to happen a lot more next year. Um, and then the last thing, dark markets. This was what Bitcoin was supposedly for originally with the Silk Road and all that. And uh, it may have been important to Bitcoin at some point in like 2013 or whenever. Um, but nowadays it doesn't seem that important to me actually because... Uh, $100 million a year is just my estimate. There's, it's hard to tell. Um, different like researchers scrape dark market websites and try to sum up what they see, but of course not everything is shown on the, is, is visible that way. And, and then law enforcement busts these markets and then you find out from like court cases um, what they learned. So this is a very rough estimate, but basically um, so, uh, $700 billion a year is a very, very rough estimate for total illegal drugs around the whole world. That's one, about 1% 1 of the global economy is maybe illegal drugs. But that's also extremely rough because no one knows how to count that either. But online drug markets are a teeny tiny fraction of that. And they're also a teeny tiny fraction of speculation and ICO funding. And I wouldn't be surprised if crypto kitties are more important than dark underground drugs on, on the internet next year. What's next here? Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so every time I talk to people from my industry, they blow my mind by espousing this new technological invention they've thought of, like prediction markets, they're going to tell the future, and like replacing Uber with an Ethereum program and all these things. And I'm not even going to try to summarize. I can't even... I don't even have the time and brain power to tell how many of these ideas are even plausible. 
I'm going to wait five years and see how many of them have actually worked. Uh, but I do know very much about what some of the problems are. The first one I keep telling in this talk is scaling, scaling, scaling. Um, it's, it's completely changed what people can and do use Bitcoin for during 2017. And I guess it's going to completely change what people can use uh, Ethereum for in 2018. So I guess maybe no one will be able to afford to uh, trade their crypto kitties at a certain point. Although I guess you can prove that you still have it. So that's interesting. Like if you trade crypto kitties, then once Ethereum fills up and nobody can afford to make an Ethereum transaction for such a low value thing as trading crypto kitties, then I guess you just keep yours after that. That's cool. Uh, I just thought of that. But the other thing is um, safety is a huge ongoing problem. It, the total amount of Bitcoin that's probably been lost or stolen, here's another number that nobody really knows how to measure, but this is an estimate. The total amount of Bitcoin that's probably been lost or stolen ever since it was invented is about $10 billion worth of Bitcoin today. And the total amount of ether that's been lost or stolen in like two years or however many years that it's been running is $1 billion worth of ether lost or stolen. And a lot of that, it's almost even worse with ether than with Bitcoin because you can lose or get or make vulnerable your money by a coding error in the script the script you're writing to run in ethereum so i think this is a pressing issue that's likely to get even worse next year and a lot of those numerous projects that are trying to improve on the state of the art and innovate technologically are aiming to improve on one of these two things yeah like i said earlier i think we'll see more gaming if we can afford it maybe Maybe people will switch to other coins that have less loaded networks or somebody will make a breakthrough in scaling. Here's a snapshot of the marketplace for trading. This is the thing that all those people who are trading $500 billion worth of trading are look at all day long. And uh, there's a whole bunch of different coins on here. All of these, well... There's like, this is just the first 14 lines of like a 900 line website because there are literally hundreds and hundreds of coins of various kinds. Um, that one with the red circle slash in the middle there, that's not even a coin, it's actually a Ponzi scheme. And like, I don't just mean it's a bad investment, I mean it's literally a Ponzi scheme where they actually take your money and put it in your pocket and lie to you about what you got. Um, put it in their pocket, I mean. Uh, but anyway, but a lot, I think basically all the rest of them are more or less legitimate technology projects with interesting users and enthusiastic communities. And these are my five, these are the five that I'm most interested in and that I wanted to tell you something about. Um, what they have in common is that they have really active and sort of impassioned user communities and developers that are improving them. Um, Bitcoin, I guess you know about, and uh, one thing that I love about it is that it's super stable. They have now, as of 2017, they've conclusively demonstrated that they won't change, that the Bitcoin protocol will not get changed in a backward incompatible way, and so it's extremely stable and predictable now, and it has this very broad, widespread, and very committed, impassioned um, users who, it's basically like a cult. And that's cool, that's awesome. Um, and the other ones actually have really impassioned user communities as well. And there's, they tend to be separate communities because, you know, people tend to clump together. Um, and between some of them, there is like tribal enmity. Um, I, try to, uh, I try to set the example in the Zcash community that we have a much more porous community boundary and we're all, we're all members of the other communities as well because we love them too and we're all just friends here. But not everyone is like that. Um, The 300 billion is the is again that's that somewhat mysterious number about the total numbers of bitcoins that exist multiplied by the current price of a bitcoin, which is some kind of estimate of how important it is to somebody, rich people, I guess. Um, Ethereum is the next biggest from that same measure, and Ethereum is super important because it's got the developer 
community, like the, the network effect of developers, because developers who are inventing new stuff, they're, they're making a new game, or they want to make a new app that they're going to sell access to or whatever, uh, or they're just hacking in their bedroom and they want to see what they can do and write some scripts and share them with other people. Almost all of those people go to work on Ethereum because that's, it's uh, inviting and easier than working on the other systems. Um, and that's really important. History of, of like the computer industry tells us that the network effect of developers is super important for the long term what's going to be the most important technology and the most widely used, because that that's what we learned from like Microsoft and um, like the World Wide Web, for example. So that's something super important about Ethereum. Okay, Bitcoin Cash is an interesting case. It just now sprang out of nothing um, this year. And what it is, is it's a fork of Bitcoin. So they, they copied the Bitcoin code base, but they also copied the Bitcoin ledger, right? Um, so everybody who at that moment owned Bitcoin, then the next moment they also owned, they still own this Bitcoin, but they also own the same amount of Bitcoin cash because they copied the ledger. Make sense? And then, and then they, they made some tweaks, but the important thing about it is that they're the refuge from the Bitcoin civil war that's raged for the last like three years uh, between uh, liberals who wanted to upgrade the protocol, the Bitcoin protocol, and conservatives who wanted to keep the Bitcoin protocol stable. And the conservatives won on Bitcoin, and uh, all of the people who wanted to change the Bitcoin protocol have started migrating en masse altogether, and they're heading toward Bitcoin Cash. I was sort of annoyed when this happened, because Zcash, they could have headed towards Zcash, which I was the, you know, we launched it a year ago, and... Uh, and Zcash is just as good as Bitcoin Cash is at, which is not very good, at um, scaling up and sending more transactions. Like, it can send a few more transactions than Bitcoin can, but not a lot more. Um, however, what we didn't have was giving every current Bitcoin holder some of our coin. See? So when Bitcoin Cash launched just a few months ago, they both had the social moment that um, the people who had lost in the, in the social battle needed somewhere to go and to be together. And they gave everyone free coins if they would come there. So that was really interesting how successful that was. And now it's more important than Monero and Zcash and less important than Bitcoin and Ethereum if you believe that number as a measure of importance. Uh, Monero is a really important coin. It's one of the older ones. And I love it because the Monero community really values privacy. Um, and it's a very community-oriented, like anti-corporate, decentralized um, zeitgeist in their community. And I really don't like to talk shit about other coins because um, it doesn't do anybody any good. And I really want more and better... Um, more and better invention and sharing and creation and value creation. But I do have to say, I have a problem with Monero, which is the technology is just not good enough for security. And I can't go into the details right now because it's complicated and I don't have slides. Um, but basically, Monero was invented before certain breakthroughs in cryptography that we were able to use in Zcash. And so in Zcash, we can use, we can leverage encryption. We can make it so that in order for an attacker to extract private information about the users, the attacker has to literally break encryption, like crack at ES or uh, the curve cryptography. Um, it has to do something which would also enable them to destroy the whole internet and all the computers in the world, or take over all the computers in the world. And, uh, and Zcash isn't quite there. Like, we've, we've deployed encryption in Zcash, um, which is a, a victory, and I'm very proud of it, but it's not ubiquitous enough and good enough in Zcash. Um, so we have a lot of work to do, but... It's possible to make much more uh, reliable, 
privacy technology than Monero currently has. And something that's really good about Monero is that they have this active and um, enthusiastic uh, community, also a cult. And that's great because they, um, they encourage and support researchers to improve it. And unlike Bitcoin, Monero is not averse to backwards incompatible upgrades and improvements. So they will hopefully continue to improve their technology. Um, Zcash, I'm not going to say too much about. We launched it more than a year ago. It's based on a bunch of like hardcore science. Um, it, it includes backwards compatible clear text transactions, and that's the worst thing about its security, as contrasted with Monero, where there's no backwards compatible uh, clear text transactions, so you have to kind of leap all the way to um, the higher tech transactions. And in Zcash, we decided to try to make it easy to get Bitcoin users to get on board by giving them a Bitcoin-like starting point. Um, so that's a good thing for Zcash adoption and usage, but it's a bad thing for Zcash privacy. Um, the other thing I want to say about Zcash is that I'm really not going to be satisfied if by the end of like, let's say 2018, people still call it a privacy coin because it's like when Netscape added encryption to the web browser, it didn't make a privacy browser. It didn't make it good for browsing the privacy web. No, it's just encryption is a necessity for the web. Like you can't have, you can't use the web for anything that's important without encryption. And similarly, I don't think you can really use decentralized networks, world computers, or cryptocurrencies for anything that's important, or I mean, for anything other than speculation, um, if you don't have encryption or something similarly strong to protect privacy. Um, so yeah, in fact, one of the things that we're probably going to be focusing on in the Zcash development team uh, in 2018 is the scaling question. Um, mm, I have a little bit of time to go into that. So I told you a little bit about Lightning, right? And it's a beautiful idea, and I may just totally misunderstand it, and a lot of the makers of Lightning are here, so if I totally tell you wrong things, then they should come up uh, to the microphone uh, right away at, during Q&A, which is in 15 minutes. Um, but from my understanding, there's a fundamental, there's a couple of potential fundamental problems that prevent Lightning from being a scaling solution. Um, so remember the first step in Lightning is that you take your Bitcoin and you commit it to, to be leveraged for being able to do off-chain Lightning payments. Well, currently it costs like at least $10, $20 to do that step. So if you only have $10 worth of Bitcoin, you just can't use Lightning, right? Am I missing something? So that doesn't seem like a complete scaling solution for like the entire world, in my opinion, because most people don't have $10 worth of Bitcoin and never could have, no matter what. Um, but maybe there's a solution that someone is already thinking about that I don't understand, and if so, I hope it doesn't take five years to deploy it. But that's one possibility, and we're what I want to do with Zcash is watch that carefully, because the Lightning people have done a lot of really solid engineering. They have multiple teams working on it, and they just finalized their 1.0 specification, and they've done interop testing, and there's a button somewhere in this building where if you go poke the button, it sends a micropayment over the Bitcoin testnet um, to demonstrate that Lightning actually works over the Bitcoin testnet. But I don't think it could work on the mainnet because you, well, I guess it could. You just have to put in like 20 bucks into your button, and then that would work. Anyway, so Lightning Network is a really great possibility. Then there's the, um, the Bitcoin Cash approach that resulted in that like three year long civil war that's finally over, thank God, it was just, we'll just make the blocks bigger and tune up the parameters, like increase the capacity of the network. And um, there are a lot of detailed arguments that I'm not sure how to evaluate about whether that's good or bad or indifferent. Um, but one thing I'm really sure is that it's not going to result in a whole lot more scaling, I don't think. I mean, so far, Zcash and Bitcoin Cash have roughly quadrupled the capacity. But if we get four times as many users in 2018 as we got in 2017, then we'll be back to where we started. And I really don't know if you can just keep doubling it every year, what happens. So that's a, that's a possibility. It might work. Uh, I would 
tend to try to wait and see both scientific and empirical validation of how it works in practice. Um, Where's the third thing? Oh, Ethereum is working on this concept called sharding. And I love the Ethereum people because for like for years now, ever since I first heard about Ethereum, like before it even, like the first moment it was being designed, I've always said, that's awesome, but way too complicated and ambitious to actually work. And then they would go ahead and do it and it would actually work. And so then I would be amazed and then it would iterate again. They would say, we're gonna do this next thing. And I would say, that's brilliant and I love that, but that'll ne you'll never pull it off. And then they would pull that off. So the next thing that they're doing, which I don't think they could ever really succeed at, is taking Ethereum and making it so it's still a single world computer, but it parallelizes the computations to like thousands of like sub networks and then knits the computations back together again uh, in time for you to receive your newly bred crypto kitty. So that's what they're working on. It's called sharding. And I don't know with lightning sharding and just turning up the parameters, I don't know. I think we'll learn a lot in the next year from people's attempts to do that, um, all three of them. And so that's what we're doing at Zcash is sort of watching those like hawks trying to figure out what's going to work and what we should copy or if we need to come up with a fourth idea ourselves to make Zcash more widely usable. Okay, I'm almost out of time, thank goodness. Oh good, this is my last slide. Um, so I've been traveling the world. I, I like to say I'm an imaginary coin salesman. I've been traveling the world telling people about the virtues of Zcash. Um, it's been really nice giving this talk, which is mostly not about the virtues of Zcash. Um, but uh, these are not the most important countries in the world. There are several important continents with billions of people that are not even mentioned on this slide. But these are six interesting ones. The top three are the most important if you believe in total amount of coins bought and sold that day as being a measure of importance. So um, Japan buys and sells more crypto coins every day than any other country does. 10 minutes till questions. Actually, I might stop before 10 minutes so you guys should start coming up with your questions. And I think it would be cool if the first question came from a woman. So if you're a woman and you have a question, you should hurry to the... <laughs> so... So there's this perfect storm of things happening in Japan, which is that the government has this very simple and reasonable regulatory framework, which makes it apparent to all the businesses and the industry on the right-hand side, and all the people who might want to gamble their savings, that um, the government considers cryptocurrencies to be a legitimate, normal, real thing. And I think that's actually because of Mt. Gox, you know, which was the biggest cryptocurrency exchange ever. And then it was, rate, uh, all the Bitcoins disappeared. We all closed, closed our eyes and counted to 10. And when we opened them, the Bitcoins were gone. And it was like the most Bitcoins ever that disappeared. And that thing was headquartered in Japan. So, and that was, what, five years ago now? Um, so maybe in addition to technologies being turned into products or in conceptions being turned into products. Also, it takes five years for disasters to be turned into laws. But as of this year, uh, the government of Japan passed some laws explaining what businesses and people would be required to do around cryptocurrencies. And just the fact that the laws exist has, has encouraged people to buy and sell them at high rates of speed. That's why Japan is the most important country. U.S. is the second most important country. I spent a lot of time talking to United States regulators and law enforcement and people like that. And they largely have their hearts in the right place. Like they want to not discourage the development of potentially valuable technology and they want to protect consumers from being robbed or, uh, or, or scammed and so forth. But on the other hand, it takes them for fucking ever to get anything done. And, uh, and there are literally dozens, like 60 or 80 different agencies in the United States that are, that potentially are empowered to regulate and oversee different kinds of financial and technological things. So nobody even knows which agency has actually got the authority to make which kinds of rules about stuff. And they're making progress over the last couple of years. Uh, they're heading in the right direction. 
And the fact that they seem to be have their hearts in the right place from the perspective of entrepreneurs and be heading in the right direction from the perspective of entrepreneurs has encouraged the industry in the United States, in Silicon Valley, um, and people in the United States are buying lots and lots of Bitcoins and other coins every day. And South Korea is a really fun, interesting case. It's one of the biggest um, markets in terms of uh, people buying it, and it's really mainstream in South Korea, like, I think more so than almost anywhere else. Uh, like, half, maybe, of all people are aware of Bitcoin as a thing that they might consider buying, and um, there are these major, like, the, the, the chat app that every single Korean person uses all day long, it the company behind that chat app has bought a cryptocurrency exchange and the gaming uh, service like Steam that, that half of Koreans are playing games on every day that has launched its own cryptocurrency service. So there's a lot going on in the industry and in the community, but the Korean government, South Korean government can't seem to make up its mind. The other day, the prime minister of South Korea was publicly wringing his hand saying that um, all this coin stuff might lead the uh, nation's youth into corruption. Uh, or maybe lead them to drugs. And I wasn't sure why. I thought that was funny, what he's worried about. But um, oh, China's an interesting case. Is there anything else to say? Yeah, okay. So there's all this interesting stuff going on, like the government of Venezuela just announced that they're going to launch their own cryptocurrency, but they don't appear to know what one is. <laughs> um, Okay, but I'm going to save some more time for questions. So my original questions at the time was, is this all hype and mania and craziness and tulips or what? And my answer is, it's definitely not just hype. There's definitely a lot of hype. And I don't know if it's like 50% or 99% of the money that's currently at stake is going to disappear or flee uh, in the future or 10% or whatever. There's definitely a lot of hype, but there's definitely a lot of things going on here which are not, which are real things that were previously impossible and are now definitely possible and are, are demonstrated to be valuable to people. Um, is it gonna be used for good or ill? Well, I didn't actually say anything about that. You'll have to make up your own mind. I tried to give just a lot of empirical facts about things I've observed. Um, but for my personal conviction, this kind of technology is inherently empowering. And my conviction is that when you empower people, them using it for good and to help each other and lift each other up is going to outweigh them using it in order to oppress smaller groups or uh, harm each other or do ill. That's just what I think, that's, that's my beliefs about humanity. So I think in the long run, at the large scale, these technologies are gonna be very, very good and very powerful and disruptive. Um, and that's what I think. Okay. <sighs> Thank you so much. We have a lot of time for questions, so step up to the microphones and... Okay, microphone six. Okay, um, hi, thanks for the talk. Here I am. Where's six? Here. Oh. Hello. Um, so, uh, since uh, Christmas just passed and you talk to normal people at the family table and try to explain uh, cryptocurrencies, which is a hard time, uh, well, how would you explain on to people to invest into cryptos? Um, so what's the motivation um, for them, not, which is not just speculation? So what should be a, a motivation for normal people to buy cryptocurrencies? That's a good question. I think the only good reason right now is just speculation, which you excluded. So, and I try not to give investment advice. Um, I guess if somebody were, like my family at Christmas, were demanding investment advice, I would tell them not to invest more than they could afford to lose. <laughs> uh, we're going to take the next one from microphone three. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, how is your view on this uh, child and this uh, parent-child chain approach that uh, some cryptocurrencies are doing at the moment? Um, is it solving the problem? It's one of those things that goes into that slide called new technology that I don't know yet. I don't really know how to evaluate. 
There's a lot of those. There's a lot of different ideas that people who are way smarter than me seem to think are great ideas, and uh, I'm very uh, empirically oriented, so I'm going to wait and see if they can get it running first. Thanks. Okay. Uh, now we have a question from the internet, from someone who's watching the stream right now. Thank you. In one of your slides, you said that only a tiny fraction of transaction is actually used for illegal stuff. Uh, where does this uh, number come from? Um, what is the source? That's a good question. Um, this estimate of, dr of illegal drugs is from... There's a couple of studies. One was by the RAND Corporation, and um, one was by some academic researchers who I can't remember right now, I'm sorry. And um, mostly what they were doing was just uh, visiting darknet websites and um, counting up uh, how many drugs were for sale at what price, um, which would ex be expected to underestimate. And so therefore, I doubled the number when I wrote this slide. <laughs> so, so it's that kind of estimate. Nobody knows, but at least I'm honest about it. Sorry. Next. Microphone number four. That's what the little tilde means, is that it's really uncertain before the, yeah. Thank you for your talk. And what are you thinking about proof of stage or alternatives to proof of work? That's a good one. Proof of stake is this really interesting uh, concept. It's, um, seems very promising. And it's to switch. You know how Bitcoin uses proof of work where your computer is doing some unforgeable. It's basically paying a cost in a way that it can prove to everyone else that it paid a cost. That's proof of work. And the cost, in this case, is the cost of computing a bazillion SHA-256 hashes. Um, in Zcash, it's, it's a different thing that is more friendly to GPUs instead of ASICs, but whatever. It's still, the whole point of it is just you're proving that you paid a cost, and then that is the basis of where we don't think anyone will attack the network by uh, paying so much cost that they can outweigh all of the other miners in the whole network. That's the whole concept of proof of work, which was the breakthrough, really, in Satoshi's paper. And then there's this newer concept called proof of stake, which is that we could replace that by instead of proving, showing that you did something costly, you could verifiably lock up some of your money, some of your crypto money, in order to show that you're in order to limit how much someone could attack the network by doing this, because they would have to lock up a whole bunch of crypto money. And then there's a really neat thing about proof of stake, which is that um, you can then confiscate and redistribute their money if, they, uh, if you can verify that they were lying or attacking the network. So that's interesting. Uh, but basically, it is, boils down to another one of those technologies that I'm not sure about yet. There are a lot of smaller coins that have deployed proof of stake, um, but they're not big enough and important enough for people to attack them or for them to be stressed uh, tested yet. So I'm not convinced by the empiricism of that observation. And um, there's a lot of good scientific research on proof of stake, which looks pretty promising. So I consider it a really promising um, thing for the future. Hope that helped. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is microphone one. Hello. Um, I have a question regarding the usability of cryptocurrencies as real currencies for everyday use. As I have seen with Bitcoin, it's insanely valuable and insanely volatile, and it's insanely expensive to do transactions. And it's all things that make a currency useless, equally useless if they are worth nothing, you can't use a currency, if it's too yeah. uh, if it's too valuable, you can't use it either. What would be needed from a technical standpoint to make cryptocurrencies an everyday currency that actually can be used to do real stuff? Well, I don't know if the volatility and the value is the most important factor. It might be, but I could imagine if we could solve the other problems, which we know about, like safety, like it's UX is the number one thing, right? It, like if you ever tried to help some random newbie who's not a total geek use a cryptocurrency for anything, it's just hell. It's ridiculous. Um, so we can't really go blaming economics when, when that's the, the UX is an obvious stumbling block. Um, and then there's the scale problem that we just talked about where um, a currency by necessity is only useful and valuable when like everyone else you know is also using it. And so 
A, we would have to bootstrap to get to that scale, uh, but B, none of the current technology could support it if we did. So that's another obvious fundamental stumbling block where we can't really blame economics when we can't even supply the fundamental behavior in the first place. Okay, then, yes, there's an economics question, and my sense, my very vague sense is that um, you can fix, you can, people will be willing to spend money in order to gain uh, value despite the volatility and other questions because either you could hold your money and there's a lot of ways maybe that's my answer thank you <laughs> thank you hey there look is women a huge hey look women women nice you're you're late I I, I tried somewhat anyway you know where else we have a lot of women the internet and they also have a question but let's take my women one cats first. on the internet so many things um, okay uh, I have a lot of questions but I'll limit it to one um, to sort of touch on what you were saying about UX being super important um, I found even during the course of this conference it's been challenging talking to people with a really strong technical focus of the importance of UX in mm. actually you know adopting and using a technology and being useful and, and so what would your persuasive argument to technically minded people be for like you know if you had to do the hard sell uh i'm not so good at that but I, i'm empirical um or but empirically persuasive you know moxie marlin spike i love that guy is he here uh moxie marlin spike gave it a talk once and he said um the strategy for the first sort of era of the cypherpunk project was we'll make tools that are really good for us to use and then step two, we'll make everyone else be like us. Right, right. And I was like, oh, you're right, that was what we were doing back then, wasn't it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'm, me too, I was part of that, uh, mea culpa. Um, so empirically, what we've learned in the last, you know, 15 years is that UX is king and network effects, positive network effects are king. So that's why Facebook is super duper important and Diaspora is not. Is that thank a good you. enough answer? Yeah, that's, that's, thank you. So now we'll have to take that question from the internet. It will be read in a male voice. It might be from a woman. We'll never know. <laughs> Th thank you. Um, two brief questions. Um, first one, how can you make a cryptocurrency private and traceable at the same time? And the second one, do you think digital currencies might be outlawed? And what happens then? Good questions. The first one alludes to my least favorite tweet that I ever made, uh, where I said we could make Zcash private and traceable. So I forget exactly how I put it, but um, if you read the whole thread instead of just the tweet, I was, uh, I was saying that um, this will probably work at least as long as the criminals whom I was complaining about at the time want to cash out to fiat, because the way our whole financial system works both with paper, cash, and bank transfers, and SWIFT, and everything else, and credit cards, and everything else, is that the, um, the gateway between the different um, networks is controlled by financial institutions, and it's the financial institution's job uh, to spy on and report on their customers on behalf of their local governments. Um, anyway, so basically, I guess my argument is Zcash and Bitcoin are not really different or really much worse for that kind of regulation than the whole rest of the current system is, if that makes sense. And the other question was, will governments outlaw cryptocurrency? That's a really good question. And um, we've already gotten empirical evidence about that because some have, like um, China has outlawed um, various uses of cryptocurrency. South Korea has outlawed like two out of three uses of cryptocurrency, but has allowed the third. Um, Venezuela doesn't really have laws, but the police go around extorting miners and stealing their money. Um, uh, Russia, like every other day, they put out another announcement from a different part of the Russian government saying they will or will not outlaw cryptocurrencies. Um, and at the same time, other countries, like Japan is the leading example, but a lot of other countries, big and small, are making completely different sorts of policies. So that's pretty interesting patchwork of different policies. Um, my prediction for the United States is that they're no way going to outlaw cryptocurrencies in the United States. And it's one of the most important countries by this measure. Um, and that they're heading towards, instead, legitimizing them more and more. Okay. 
back to microphone one. You didn't tell us anything about this ceremony. Maybe you want to say something about that. Thanks for saying that because I forgot to mention that there's a ceremony like training session happening today at some point. I guess it'll be on the schedule as a self-organized event. But the ceremony is this really complicated thing we don't have time to explain where the kind of crypto the kind of zero knowledge proofs used in Zcash you require to generate the certain public like cryptographic value and you want to make sure it was generated in a correct way so that nobody could insert a backdoor into cryptographic value. And so the ceremony is a process to get multiple people who are all like preventing each other from inserting a backdoor. So the more people, like an attacker would have to compromise all of the participants and like surreptitiously backdoor all of their computers at once in order to get a backdoor into the cryptographic value. And we, are, we already did this more than a year ago for, for the first release of Zcash, but we're currently in the process of doing it again with a lot more people. Because the first time around for performance, computational uh, cost reasons, we couldn't only handle six people in the first ceremony. And right now we're doing another ceremony which should be able to handle any number of people, like practically, um, like at least 100 maybe. And... Uh, <laughs> I mean, if more than 100 people like show up and offer to help, then we could probably do that too. But, um, uh, but it also, the new ceremony is not just for Zcash, it's, for, it's useful for this kind of efficient general purpose zero knowledge proof for any other cryptocurrency or even for non-cryptocurrencies for proving the correctness of your identity and some kind of future government ID system or uh, proving that some kind of server computed correctly on your data. So anyway, it's just general purpose zero knowledge proofs, which are a really powerful, interesting new tool. And if you look in the schedule, I'm sorry, I don't know if anyone knows, but there's supposed to be a zero knowledge ceremony too, so that you can participate in the current second generation ceremony. And it's supposed to be, I think it's 6.30 today. Yeah, it's, it's right after this talk. Right after this talk, thank you. And you are now responsible for another 50 meters long line somewhere at CCL, probably, for the ceremony. I'm responsible for what? For the line to the ceremony. <laughs> I, I didn't understand, sorry. Sorry. Wait there, let's take another question. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> it involved me being responsible for something, so I'm happy to not know what it was. You're responsible for a lot of things by now, you know. Yeah. <laughs> including answering more questions. Hmm? I'm responsible for a lot of things right now, including answering more pick questions. Pick a microphone. Oh, pick a microphone? Uh, I pick Dara. Okay. Um, it seems like centralized protocols are winning. I mean, um, in social networks, in, in payment systems, they're in a very entrenched position. You have Visa, you have um, mobile networks like M-Pesa, um, Webmo and things. Do decentralized protocols and systems have sufficient advantages that they are going to take over? That's a really super great question. I don't know for sure. And one, I mean, so the pessimistic thing, like I'm a veteran of trying to produce decentralized, privacy preserving, user protecting things that turn out not to be as appealing as the centralized user vulnerable making alternative. Um, so the pessimistic answer is no, sure, like as soon as, as soon as Bitcoin and Ethereum and Zcash turn out to be a real threat, then like Facebook will just make Facebook coin and everyone will use that. But there's a better answer, which is that those centralized systems, they do, they have the ability to scale up really high and fast and scale in terms of the network effect seems to be the most important thing. But they also have like a self-limiting factor. Like Facebook can't get much bigger than it is, right? Because, I don't know, because different countries or different people or different other social networks aren't willing to join it or something. I don't know. The same with like religions and nations. Like nations are super awesome and they're very high scale and there's a lot of value from having everyone be part of the same nation, but they're also kind of like self-limiting. Like the United States can't get it much bigger than it is no matter how it tries. Um, Anyway, and so I kind of hope that decentralized things can break that ceiling, can be bigger than that, because everyone can be willing to rely on a decentralized network even when they are unwilling to share a nation or a religion or a language or a social network or whatever. Okay. I hope so. Thank you. Thanks.
we've been told that we are consistently ignoring the microphone number two. <laughs> okay, well, I'm so sorry. Microphone number two. Uh, no, nope. gonna be number two, sorry. Uh, have, have there been any useful applications for society for cryptocurrencies so far besides maybe donating to organizations like WikiLeaks where it's blocked, which can't be done, uh, like applications which can't be done by traditional currencies? Yeah, well, I think the donating one is a good, useful example, and that's still ongoing. There are a lot of organizations that, maybe not because they're being targeted by a national, a powerful major national government, but for other reasons they can't accept, like PayPal in their country or whatever. Um, I've also seen um, in the morass hell of Venezuela how both the fiat currency and the government and the banking system are all inoperable. Um, people can use cryptocurrencies to transfer money across the border in Venezuela, but that's of limited scope and value right now, but it's more than nothing. Um, I liked your question because it was empirical. Other empirical uses. Um, crypto kitties make people happier? <laughs> Besides that? There's probably more that I'm not thinking of. I tried so far pretty hard. So who is it that we're overlooking that we're supposed to? Hi. Okay, so people at the microphone number six are jumping and waving their hands. But who, why, so. why are you guys all shouting out? Who, why are they shouting five? Let's say five. They just shout the loudest. Well, the five is popular, I guess. Okay, five. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> no? Uh, thanks for the talk. On? So my question was concerning uh, why should I choose to uh, make a contract on Ethereum or any other blockchain uh, compared to a classic uh, yeah, um, a contract not on the blockchain? I mean, I have all these disadvantages. Uh, a coders are writing the contract, which are most of the time not legal experts. Uh, just a single yeah. bug can ruin my question. whole problem. So let me why? interrupt you. I think... Um, <laughs> They shouldn't have called them smart contracts on Ethereum, and they shouldn't have called them contracts. They should have just called them programs, because we know what those are like, right? Um, so the point, in my opinion, the point... <laughs> very enthusiastic crowd. <laughs> anyway, so maybe you can use programs to accomplish some of the same things that you would have used a contract for. I don't know, maybe not. There's a lot of caveats, but that's my starting point. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so there is an now. acrobatic number happening next to the microphone number six. I think we have to give them the voice. Wow. Could you please explain a bit about uh, how ZK snarks work? Uh. <laughs> ZK snarks are a very sophisticated cryptographic technique, so it's hard for me to understand myself, much less explain. Um, there's one component of it that I think is helpful for people, uh, which is the notion of a zero-knowledge proof by, by, by metaphor, which is that um, if, y if you're colorblind and I have two billiard balls, that's one's red and one's green, and I want to prove to you that they're different from each other, but not by telling you this is the red one. So this is a weird case, but bear with me. So a zero knowledge proof is a weird concept because it means that you can prove something to someone without giving them any other information other than that the thing you said is true. So it's kind of like, I am a truth teller and it's impossible for me to lie, sort of. Um, but you want to not expose any other information. So with the billiard ball example, I might want to prove to you that I have two different colored balls, but I don't want to give you any information about which one's the red one. And the way you can accomplish that is I can give you the balls and I can ask you to hold them behind your back and swap them back and forth or don't swap them, but you're choosing whether or not to swap them and you're not telling me. And then you reveal them to me and then I just tell you whether or not you swapped them. But I don't tell you that's the red one, because that's the thing I don't want to give away. So when I do that, so you bring it out from behind your back, and I say, yep, you swapped them. 
And then you think to yourself, well, he might, they might both be green, and he's just fooling me, and he just guessed, right? So then what we do is we do it again. You hold them behind your back again, and you swap them, or don't, you bring them out again, and this time I tell you, nope, they're in, you didn't swap them this time. So you think to yourself, well, maybe he guessed twice. Uh, but then you keep doing that over and over. So you do it like 100 times in a row. And every time you do it, I correctly tell you whether or not you swapped them. But I never say that's the red one. At the end of this, you're convinced there must be two different colors. But you've gotten zero information about which one's the red one. So that's a very simple metaphor that shows the concept of a zero knowledge proof. And there's still like 15 math ideas, half of which I don't understand, to explain ZK snarks. By the way, thank you. And by, by the way, there's an explainer series on our website, z.cash/blog. Um, go to Z, ZK Snark Explainers, and that has much more technical details. How is that a question? <laughs> it's not. Okay, uh, we have people next to the microphone number three who don't shout, don't dance, they just stand there in silence. And I think we should reward patience and modesty by letting them ask the last question for this talk. Uh, hello. Yeah, thanks for your talk. I actually have a bunch of questions, but I'm just going to ask two. Um, so, <laughs> so talking the last about, two questions for yeah, this talk. Talking about centralization, um, what do you think about the growing inequality? So basically, you have a few people who hold most of the bitcoins are also other coins and who are able to decide which, you know, if, if it's going to fluctuate how much and it's going to mm -hmm. have a huge effect. Yeah. And the second one, I recently read in the news that you started working together with JP Morgan. So, um, I mean, I'm confused. Um, what was, what, uh, why would you do that? And don't you think that the financial world will eventually destroy most cryptocurrencies because they can? Okay, the, f the, f the first question, the second question is why would I, why would we work with JP Morgan? Um, it would, we, we have been able to help them make this blockchain that they could potentially use for their enterprise blockchain use cases um, in the financial industry. Um, so that might be valuable to them or their customers. And it was also really helpful for persuading um, people from that world, like the regulators and the, you know, the startups and the enterprises over in USA, um, that I could point to JP Morgan as an example of how privacy is important for business. Privacy is important for commerce. Because a lot of people don't learn from argument or theory, they only learn from example. So it was really useful for me to be able to, uh, instead of having to go around what I had been doing previously, was go around saying, privacy is going to be important for normal old mainstream tax-paying commerce. Um, and after we did that deal with JP Morgan, I got to name drop JP Morgan and say, for example, this is why the most valuable bank in the world is working with our technology because privacy is necessary for commerce. And that went a lot further with that crowd. Um, and your other, and, and, you, and you said, don't I think the financial industry is gonna destroy cryptocurrencies because they can? No, I don't think they can. So, no, I don't think they can. <laughs> um, the first of your questions, was, uh, what was it again? It was a good one. Uh, inequality. Oh, yeah, that's a really good one. I'm yeah. afraid we don't have time for any more questions. It's a really important question, uh -oh. and hopefully future technology something something, but it's definitely true. There is a lot of inequality. <laughs> but thank you for the really important question. Thank you all. Okay. Zuko.